Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elling, the CEO and founder of Ella Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. On today's episode, I am delighted to welcome Hubert Jolie, author of The Heart of Business, senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School and former chairman and CEO at Best Buy since 2012. He led the company through what is called one of the most stunning turnarounds of the last decade, entitled the Renew Blue Transformation, which resulted in improved customer satisfaction, market share gains, revenue growth, and improved margins. Under Uber's leadership, Best Buy stock grew tenfold. Hubert Jolie has been recognized as one of the top 100 CEOs in the world by Harvard Business Review, one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's, and one of the top 10 CEOs in the U.S. by Glassdoor. He currently serves on the board of directors of Johnson & Johnson, Ralph Lauren, Sciences Po Foundation, the board of trustees of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the International Advisory Board of HEC Paris. Hubert, thank you for joining me today. It's so good to see you again. And thank you, Janice. What a pleasure it is to be here with you. Well, Hubert, you and I met several years ago when you and Best Buy were honored at the Women's Forum of New York Breakfast of Corporate Champions, and you were on the CEO panel speaking on the business imperative for gender parity. And you talked about the impressive diversity of the Best Buy board. And in fact, by the time you stepped down in June 2020, you had 13 directors on your board, with the majority of them being women and three African Americans. Then and now, you have actively invested in efforts to advance meaningful diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why is this so important to you, Bear? And what are the benefits you see? For me, I think like for many people, uh, diversity is essential to business success, right? I think organizations do well when everyone at the company feel that they belong, that they are seen, that they are respected, that they can be the, the best, biggest, most beautiful version of themselves. So we start with each individual. But then, of course, you have to look at uh, systemic issues around gender and, and, and race uh, and ethnicity in particular. And there, you know, it's so obvious that, uh, you know, your leadership team, your team in general needs to reflect, you know, your customers and the communities in which you uh, operate. And it'd be complete madness from a business standpoint you know, to want to recruit only from a quarter of the population of the country. Why, why would that make any sense? Uh, and you know, if I take an example, if you operate a store in some parts of Chicago, if your blue shirts don't speak Polish, you know, you're not going to sell much. And so uh, whether it's, you know, whatever dimension of diversity you're talking about, it is really critical. And of course, since the horrible murder of George Floyd, you know, last May in Minneapolis, the level of intensity uh, around, in particular, the racial dimension has gone up. And I think we have to be real here. It's obvious that as a country and as a set of corporations, in particular on the racial dimension, black uh, diversity, uh, we've not made enough progress. Uh, and so it's, it's, something, it's one thing to talk about it, uh, but you know, if I quote you know, Nike, you, you just have to do it. And so now that we know, because it's unavoidable to realize that this is a, a business imperative, a human imperative, a social, societal imperative, it's more now about doing it. And I think in the corporate world, Janice, can we agree that once we've decided that something was a priority, we know how to deal with it, right? That's what we do all day long. And so in this uh, diversity front, you know, I think what you're seeing companies do now is they, they do, they're doing the work, right? So the, the diagnosis about, you know, if, if our workforce is not diverse from a gender or racial standpoint, what, where are we missing? Do the diagnosis. What changes do you need to implement? Same if you have a retention and promotion issue. Do the work in the same way that you do the work if you're not able to attract and retain customers. I think we're all seeing more and more courageous uh, uh, actions. I love the fact, for example, that the general counsel at the Coca-Cola company has written to all of their law firms and said, okay, so over the next 18 months, I'm going to evolve our portfolio and I want to make sure that the firms we work with 
uh, diverse from a race standpoint. Right. And we're going to set together some milestones. And if you miss the milestones, I'm going to reduce your fees by 30% every quarter. You know? <laughs> that's, catching, that's catching their attention. So I feel very, very strongly around this. It's about doing, not just saying. Well, that's the whole point, isn't it? There are about 700 of the Fortune 1000 who still need to get above even 35%. You were over 50% with women and, of course, people of color. Earlier this month, you released a book just published, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. Your book, which was endorsed by many people, and one was Jeff Bezos, who said, Best Buy's turnaround under Hubert Jolie's leadership was remarkable, a case study that should and will be taught in business schools around the world. Bold and thoughtful, Hubert Jolie has a lot to teach. That's a quote from Jeff Bezos. So in the book, you describe your philosophy behind the resurgence of Best Buy. The heart of the business is about as you say, pursuing a noble purpose, putting people at the center of the business, creating an environment where every employee can blossom, and treating profit as an outcome, not the goal. And you speak about unleashing human magic. What are those principles that leaders should practice to make this all happen in their companies, as you did? I think it's obvious to all of us today that the world we are in is facing a multifaceted crisis. Right? We have a health crisis, of course, an economic crisis, societal crisis, racial crisis, environmental crisis, geopolitical crisis. I mean, you name it. And what's the definition of madness, Janice, right? It's uh, doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. And if we step back, for me, there's two people on my most wanted uh, people list from the FBI, right? It's, uh, one is Milton Friedman, you know, with his focus on shareholder primacy. And the other one is... Uh, Bob McNamara, the former Secretary of Defense, who invest, invented, in a sense, top-down scientific management, right, where you take a bunch of smart people and they tell other people what to do, and then they track and, and reward it accordingly. These things don't work. So we need to rethink how we want to run business. And, and I think that the, the, the core thesis is that uh, business can be a force for good. And uh, it starts with pursuing this noble purpose. So at Best Buy, we said we're not a consumer electronics retailer. We're a company that's here to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs, which vastly expanded our addressable market uh, and also was very inspiring for our employees and our, and, our, and our customers. And today, employees and customers are demanding from companies that uh, they, they, they be forced for good. The other idea is to embrace all stakeholders, you know, the when in Minneapolis, the city was on fire after the, the murder of George Floyd, can you open the stores? No, you cannot. You cannot run a business if the community is on fire. Similarly, if the planet is on fire, you cannot run a business. So you have to embrace all of your stakeholders, including your shareholders. I see no trade-off or no competition between stakeholder capitalism and shareholder capitalism. We have to embrace all stakeholders uh, and, and serve them. And it's all through people that that you do this. So for me, you know, you asked the question about, you know, leadership. I think our, our role as leaders has changed dramatically. Our mission has changed. It's not just about shareholder value creation. It's about doing some, you know, doing some good in the world. Our scope has changed. It's not just business. It's all of the stakeholders. And the leadership model has changed. So, you know, the, the model of the leader as the superhero, the smartest person in the room who knows everything, right. is driven by power, fame, glory, and money. That's gone. We need purposeful, caring leaders uh, who are authentic and vulnerable and are there to create an environment in which others are successful. So it's not, it's not minor change. During the French Revolution, Louis XVI asked you know, one of his uh, advisors, is this a revolt? And Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld replied, no, sire, it's not a revolt. It's a revolution. <laughs> That's what we need. Because you t you really do talk about the purpose of a company is not to make money. But of course, you want to make money. But really, there are three imperatives, people, business, and finance. Do you, would you want to describe that a little bit? Most people today agree with, with this direction, right? Because uh, it's hard to argue against, frankly. The, the, the thing is that it's easy to say and easy to understand. It's really hard to do. And that's why the book is really almost a guide for any leaders uh, who is eager to abandon the old ways and embrace, you know, this idea of leading from a place of purpose 
and humanity. So, yes, uh, people, business, and finance. I, I learned that from a client when I was a consultant years ago. So he told me that the purpose was not to make money. It was not profit. It was an imperative. And he said, you know, in business, you really have three imperatives. The people imperative, which is you need to have good people with the right tools and the right motivation. You have the business imperative, which is you need to have customers or clients who are happy and want more. And then the financial imperative, which is you need to make money, but you treat it as an outcome. And now he made it very practical. So here's a very concrete piece of advice that he gave me 30 years ago. When you do your monthly uh, business performance review with your team, don't start with the financial results. Finish the meeting with the financial results. Your CFO will make sure that there is enough time spent on that. Start with people and organization. Continue ah. with customers and products and business. Right. And finish with financial results. If you do it the other way around, you won't have time for customers and people. And so whereas if you finish, if you start with people and customers, you will have time. And then you'll be focused on the real drivers, right? Because again, profit is a result. In fact, in French, Profit is, the word profit is résultat, which is result, which is exactly what it is. It right. would be if your doctor was managing your, your health with a focus on your temperature, right? Would you like that doctor who puts the, temp, the, the thermometer in the fridge or, or on the oven as appropriate? No, I want somebody who is looking at the, the, the real drivers of my health. Which are your people. Exactly. When you arrived at Best Buy in 2012, what did some of the things you did first? What were those observations? And how did you look at these challenges and say, I got to prioritize them this way? What did you do, Uber? Summer uh, or spring of 2012, I get this call, right, for the job at... Uh, at Best Buy, and I was happily employed at Carlson Companies, another great Minnesota company. And uh, so I told the Jim Citrin, the headhunter, Jim, you're crazy, right? I don't know anything about retail, and this thing is a mess. He said, no, no, no <laughs> they, they don't want a retailer. They want somebody who can provide a fresh perspective. Please do me a big favor, look at it. And so I studied, and what I saw is that uh, very simply, the, the world needed Best Buy because as consumers, as customers, for some of our electronic purchases, it's it's good to be able to touch, feel, you know, uh, see the products and be able to ask questions to a human being. So the customers needed Best Buy and the vendors needed Best Buy as well because they, they needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. So there was no strategic problem. The problem was that they were essentially self-inflicted, right? The quality of service had gone down. The online experience was horrible. You know, the, the prices were uh, not competitive and, and, and. The good news when the problems are self-inflicted is that you can fix them. And so it was not, uh, I felt we didn't need to start with strategy. We need to fix, to start with fixing what was broken. And so if that's the case, uh, then you, you, the, the, the priorities follow, right? The first priority was uh, making sure we had the right team at the top. I'm a bit of a Maoist, so I, I believe that uh, fish rot from the head. <laughs> and in a turnaround, you have to make sure that you have the, you always have to make sure you're the right team, but in the turnaround, it's particularly urgent. And then we focused on operational progress. So how did we approach this? And it's interesting, Janice, because a lot of people were telling me, Bear, cut, cut, cut. You're going to have to close stores, fire people. And that's, in a sense, the opposite of what we did. People were key to the turnaround. My first week on the job, working in stores to listen to the frontliners. And they had so much, they had all of the answers. You know? It's so, true. It's and true. Listen, yeah. listen, and, and so listening to the frontliners and then creating energy, our role as leader, yeah, coming up, you know, making sure we come up with the answers. And there it was easy, just had to listen to the frontliners. It was a lot about creating energy. So making sure that we co-created the plan, then get going, start implementing changes, making you know, making a lot of decisions, having people make a lot of decisions, celebrating successes, talking about the difficulties and working together to solve them. That was that. And you know, cutting headcount was really the last resort. So I have this view, Janice, you know, turn around your first priority, grow the revenue. It's amazing what gr revenue growth can do. If you're going to go after cost, first focus on what I call non-salary expenses, which is all of the elements in the cost structure that have nothing to do with people, which at most companies 
is the vast majority of the cost structure. Optimize benefits. So in the US, right, we're self-insured from a healthcare standpoint. So if you improve the health of your employees, you reduce your healthcare costs. Uber, is this all part of your Renew Blue transformation story? That's the essence of it. And in the book, the book is not per se, you know, the play-by-play of the Best Buy turnaround, but it's distilled uh, throughout the book. It's uh, The book is a bigger book because it's it's about the philosophy that was behind our resurgence. And this Renew Blue transformation, the first step was saving the company, which is, you know, uh, the, what I was just talking about. And then there was a second phase where it was about, you know, accelerating the growth and uh, defining what kind of company we wanted to uh, look like when we would grow up, which is when we spent a lot of a lot of time on on our purpose as a company, and then creating the environment where we could, uh, as I said, unleash human magic. Where, frankly, I, I learned so much from our leaders, in particular on the on the front line. Thank you, Hubert. Now a quick reminder to our audience, you are listening to The Future of Capitalism, Leading with Purpose in Humanity, with Hubert Jolie, former chair and CEO of Best Buy and author of The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. The topics we cover like today's are all current and a new topic with a new Game Changers released on the third Thursday of every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. Now, I want to turn back to Uber and go into your earlier career years, Uber, in terms of how all of that prepared you for this major transformation at Best Buy to where it is today. And my story is one of a significant transformation because I, you know, I grew up, I went to uh, one of the leading business schools in Europe. I was a McKinsey consultant. So I was trained, like many, to believe that uh, being smart was really important and that leading with your brain was the way to do it. Uh, and that's how you you progressed. And uh, there was some uh, turning points or milestones in, in, in my journey as a, as a leader that I want to highlight. One of them we've already talked about, which was listening to or learning from that client who told me that profit was not the goal. About at the same time, uh, two friends of mine who were monks asked me to work with them on writing an article about the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work? What is work? Is work a curse or a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise, right? Or is it, uh, is it something we do so that we can do something else like that's more fun, like, you know, watching the Vikings uh, beat the Green Bay Packers in football, which is a rare <laughs> uh, occurrence, but it's always fun. Right. Or is it part of our fulfillment as human beings? Is it part of our quest for meaning? Or like the Lebanese poet said, uh, you know, uh, Khalil Gibran, work is love made visible. And it's a choice to see how we see work. And it's, it's, a, and it's, of course, it's magical if we can do something, work in a place where we can connect what drives us with the purpose of the company. And so understanding that was a game changer for me. Uh, later on, you know, in uh, another milestone, uh, I'll, I'll skip some, but, uh, you know, was uh, starting to work with the coach in 2009. And uh, before that, if somebody had told me, um, that Jack or Mary was working with the coach, I would have said, what's wrong with Jack or Mary? Are they in trouble? Are they going to get fired? <laughs> but then you realize uh, 100% of the top 100 tennis players in the world have a coach. Same with the football teams, the uh, basketball, you, you name it. And as a an executive working on trying to get better, to become better, and have the humility to ask your team for feedback and ask for their help, on how you can get better was a big game changer. And today, you know, again, we don't need leaders who are superheroes. We, we need leaders who are humans uh, and are able to say, my name is Hubert and I need help. And my name is Hubert and I'm trying to get better at these three things. And I'd like your help. And by the way, if you're trying to get better at something, you know, you know, how can I be helpful? And so the last milestone I would highlight is at Best Buy, when I saw the power of leaders on the front line creating an environment where that that were you know, who were able to unleash this human magic, you know that really taught me something. And I'll just tell a very brief story. 
the story of one of our store general manager uh, in the Boston market who uh, would ask every one of his associates, you know, what is your dream? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Okay, write it down in the break room. My role now as the store GM is to work with you to help you achieve your dream. And if as, as leaders, we can be curious about what drives people around us and can work with them to connect what drives them with the purpose of the company, I think it's magical and transformational. That is a wonderful story, Uber. That is so wonderful. I mean, it's true. Every employee has a dream, right? And so you're trying yes. to pull that out and help them. And is that part of the culture that you feel you've left as a legacy at Best Buy? Uh, yes, because uh, it's you know one of the great things that as a leader you're proud of is that if if performance continues to improve after you leave, then you say, okay, so I think we've done we've created something uh, that's that's sustainable and that just that's durable. And I think the, the, the culture we we have at Best Buy today in that Corey Berry, my wonderful successor, and she's doing a fabulous job, right? It's, it's a culture that's very purpose-driven, right? We're here to make a positive difference in the world. And it's a very human culture. And that's why I wanted to capture that in this book. It's a, it's a formula, it's a recipe, and there's ingredients that we describe in the book that uh, can create an irrationally good performance uh, that you know benefits all stakeholders. So, you know, I'm so excited, so proud of of the team at Best Buy, and I wanted to share some of our secrets. Frankly, your successor, which is Corey Barry, and you prepared, you know, you had great bench strength, which included a woman, and she has described you as one of the most compelling and compassionate CEOs. And as you're talking, that's exactly what you have instilled in that organization. And now you're talking about this in your book, which I think is such a great lesson for all leaders. And you also talk about in terms of how you assess leadership, you talk about the five B's of leadership. Can you describe what those are? Yeah, th thank you, Janice. At, at some point in our journey, our team said, we, you know, the most decision, most important decision we make as leaders is who we put in positions of power. And I, I must admit that, you know, for too long during my career, I was placing most of the emphasis on, you know, the expertise and the experience. And I think I now believe that, uh, you know, the, the who the person is, what kind of a leader they are, is, you know, so, so critical. So they asked me to articulate what are uh, our leadership expectations, right? And so we, we had these five Bs. The first one, is we want people to be purposeful leaders, which means be clear about their own purpose in life, be curious about the purpose of people around them and how it all connects with the purpose of the company. Number two, we want them to be clear about their role as a leader, which is not to be the smartest person in the room, but more to create an environment where others can blossom. The third B is around being clear about who they're serving. And I've told all of the officers at Best Buy, Look, if you're serving yourself or your boss or me as the CEO, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that. It's okay. Except you cannot work here. We're going to promote you to customer and we're going to take good care of you as a customer, but you cannot work here. On the other end, if you're here to serve, you know, the frontliners and the organization, then we're good. The fourth B is about, you know, being values driven. Of course, integrity is essential. And the fifth B is about being authentic, an authentic leader, a, which means, you know, be human, be yourself, your full self, the, the best version of yourself, be vulnerable because that's how you connect uh, with other people. And that's how, you know, you get the spark in the, in the organization. So, and Janice, you know, everything I'm talking about could sound soft, right? The truth is it's two things. One, it's hard to do. <laughs> and right. B, um, I do believe today that uh, this approach of placing purpose as the North Star and people at the center and treating profit as an outcome is what creates the best performance uh, in, for the benefit of, uh, of all of the stakeholders. Uber, you know, you talk about the authentic uh, leader, the caring leader, the compassionate leader, putting people first. I think during 2020, and we're in the search business, as you know, it was easy for us to pull some people out of some companies because leadership did not step up 
you know, to what people needed and wanted during these horrific, unprecedented times. So you look at this as a major lesson going through, as you said, so many issues that we had during 2020, not just the pandemic. So what do you see as the opportunity for the future of capitalism and how corporate leaders should drive profits, but still be that servant leader going forward into the next decade? Last year, we did see some extraordinary examples of great leadership. Oh, we did. We did. Absolutely. Uh People leading from a place of purpose and with humanity, putting the safety of their employees and and customers first and uh, being keen to make sure that the company would come out stronger and and, uh, really leading uh, with a sense of purpose. I mean, at Best Buy, we needed to provide all of these webcams and, and, and computers and Wi-Fi systems and, and uh, refrigerators that people were working, learning, and eating from home. And so, and so you, you were on a mission and, and you were really not focused on your quarterly uh, guidance. And during that time, you really saw your employees as human beings, right? And th- there's no going back. And so looking ahead, I think that uh, as leaders, we have this huge responsibility, right? right. Um, this is not a restart. This is a reset. And all of us, last year and this year and going forward, we have this imperative to say, so what kind of a leader do I want to be? What legacy do I want to build? How do I want to be remembered? What good do I want to make, in, What create in the world? And how do I want to lead the organization? And irrespective of the level, whether you're a board member or a CEO or a supervisor in, in, in a Best Buy store and, you know, anchor into, you know, the, the good you want to do in the world and and how you want to be remembered. I think that, uh, you know, the, the impact of the COVID crisis uh, has been very uneven across industry sectors and across companies. Many companies have suffered, their top line has suffered. Uh, and is continuing to suffer. So this is an invitation to reimagine the business in a way that's focused on the underlying needs of the of the customer. So, you know, if you're a, a um, you know grocery chain, maybe you're not just a, a a store chain. Maybe you're in the business of feeding people, and there's new business opportunities that can come from that. Uh, of course, we have to reconfigure also how we work. Right? This has been this enormous. Uh, digital acceleration. And at the same time, you have to encompass, you know, the, the world around you. So just uh, a while back, President Biden renewed uh, the commitment of this country for, you know, reduction, the reduction of ca- uh, carbon footprint. It's, it's essential. I think following the, the verdict of uh, in the murder of uh, George Floyd, a commitment to building greater diversity and inclusion and addressing social injustice. Our our employees are demanding it. Our customers are demanding it. So our job as leaders, you know, is is, uh, more demanding than ever because it's not just about business. It's not just about profit. But I think it's also more exciting because we get get these platforms where we can make a positive difference in the world. So my invitation to every leader is, um, you know, what is going to be your impact in the world as the world confronts these uh, these multiple crises, what difference are you going to make? It's a it's a great invitation for this time to be our finest hour. So I'm sorry we're going to be drawing to a close soon. I could go on. Tell me what you're doing now because you you're a big proponent of giving back, staying civically engaged. What are you doing today after having had this wonderful career and a turnaround at Best Buy? Tell us about what you're involved in now. Uber. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. So after I stepped down, or I passed the baton. I decided I was not moving down to Florida to play golf with you aging white huh? men because <laughs> I, I, I don't play golf, so that's it. And I, yeah. I was not going to be a CEO anymore. So, but I wanted the next chapter to matter. So, it's about giving back, and my focus is essentially around adding my voice and my energy to this necessary refoundation of business around purpose and humanity. So. I've built my entire portfolio around that. So the book falls into this and uh, everything I'm doing around the, the book, because it's not about, you know, just doing the book. It's about carrying the message and uh, helping companies embrace this. Uh, I'm coaching and mentoring a number of CEOs and, and uh, senior executives. 
uh, and then first and foremost, I should say I'm a professor at uh, Harvard Business School, where together with others, I'm, I'm uh, on the mission to help educate leaders who make a, a positive difference uh, in, in, in the world. I'm on a couple of boards, j and and, and and Ralph Lauren, and then, of course, I'm, we have our foundation uh, with a big focus on the Best Buy Teen Tech Centers. By the way, all of the proceeds, my proceeds of the book are going to fund the Best Buy Teen Tech Centers, which are uh, for you know underserved communities to help disadvantaged uh, teenagers acquire uh, technology skills. So if you're interested in buying the book, uh, you, you, you're going to get a great book in your hands. And at the same time, you're going to help uh, in, in this mission of uh, providing opportunities for uh, disadvantaged uh, teenagers. Well, Hubert, then I'm going to have to buy many books, have you sign them and send them out to all of the leaders that I work with, because I know the proceeds are going to a good cause. That's a deal. There's no cap on how many books I will sign for you, Jen. Okay, that's great. So any parting words for our audience? I'm very optimistic about you know the, the ability of humanity to rise to the to the task, as long as we we see what needs to be done, you know, let's all be the best version of ourselves, and let's uh, let's get on with the task of creating a, a future that does not exist yet, but that can be better and more sustainable than what we have today. Uber, thank you again for joining us today and sharing your story and using your platform to make a positive impact on the world. You really have been very dedicated to social justice diversity, equity, inclusion. And I think your book is going to be a new playbook for all leaders to follow. So to our audience, Hubert Jolie's book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism, was released earlier this month and is available wherever books are sold. Hubert, I want to thank you personally for being here with us today and your contribution to uh, our podcast and to society. Janice, what a pleasure. What a delight, always. Well, we're, I'm going to take you up on signing all those books, Hubert, so stay tuned. And, <laughs> and thank you to our audience for tuning in on this game-changing conversation on leadership, Reimagined, released on the third Thursday of each month. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you to Hubert Jolie. Thank you. Thank you.